ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Yield Foundry. Now, what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be talking about uh, rammers, you know, the actual tools that allow you to make sand molds. Uh, as we know, uh, humans have been making sand molds for thousands of years. You know, they found that chiseling a shape out of a rock you know, or into the surface of a flat rock it had its you know capabilities but it wasn't exactly good enough to do what they wanted to do so they in you know they discovered uh, natural bonded sand uh, which was basically just sand on a beach that had enough clay in it to be able to to bond to each other if, when water was added and uh, they went from there making stuff pouring metal and so forth but over the centuries the rammer, you know, made a lot of developments uh, in the beginning and for, I don't know, thousands of years possibly. Uh, basically all the person who was making the molds did is go out back behind his uh, shop, as it were, and uh, got himself a piece of wood from uh, a pile, you know, the, his, his wood pile and, uh, you know, as long as it shaped, you know, it was, you know, you know, fit in his hand, he could use it to ram the sand. Uh, basically, nothing more than just like this piece of wood. He would find something that comfortably fit into his hand. Of course, being a limb on a tree, it'd be round. But uh, you know, he'd get something that worked like worked well in his hand, and he'd he'd make the uh, the uh, ram the molds using just a piece of wood. Well, over time, you know the way we humans work. Some of them uh, will found, hey, you know, this isn't really reaching all the spots I need to reach. Uh, so they went and developed a, uh, a wedge-shaped piece of wood, okay? So imagine a wedge being on the end of this, you know, and they, they would have the piece of wood that was round, and then they would use the wedge-shaped piece of wood, which most likely didn't have a real big wedge on it. All they did is just take a uh, whatever kind of knife that they had at back then like obsidian or or a sh you know broken uh, shale or what um, shale yeah shale anything that was sharp enough to be able to put a point on this they would make a point and so they would be able to ram in all those small spots that a round piece wouldn't get into okay and then later on they found that it'd be a good idea to have a a uh, you know a rammer that had a flat end so when you got done on top you just flatten everything out you know strike it off get rid of the excess uh, sand and then go from there somebody decided hey you know we could have both on one hand so you know I don't know if they, that wouldn't have been a very big leap of logic but uh, they combine, you know, humans combine things. We like to combine the capabilities of two or three items and put, make it into one so we don't have a pile of tools bigger than we are to uh, do the same job that we want to get done. So, in time, they developed a hand rammer where you would have the peen, spelled P-E-E-N, which is the wedge-shaped Part that'll get into all the nooks and crannies, like the edge of the edge of the uh, flask, and uh, in between, you know, like where it might be at the very edge of a of a tall um, pattern, you know, be able to get in there where this end, which would be is the butt, b u t t, end of the uh, rammer, wouldn't do as well. Okay, so they developed this. And for hundreds of years, uh, this was good enough. Now then came the, the invention of pneumatics, okay? Now, as in many forms of technology, the first form of pneumatic technology dates back thousands of years. In this instance, a Greek ma mathematician by the name of Hero of Alexandria now don't forget back then they didn't have first and last names uh, that hadn't been uh, well that wasn't needed 
back then because, well, we really didn't have as many people as we needed to start developing that system of naming. That basically, you were the only guy named Hero in your town. You'd be called Hero of whatever your town was in, okay? Anyway, this fellow named Hero of Alexandria wrote in the first century A.D. Or would that be current era? C.E. Uh, how he used to used wind to generate power and transport objects. Now, don't forget, in the very beginning, this wasn't him saying, I am going to invent pneumatics. Basically, he was just proving that air could be used to do work. Okay? Uh, many, many hundreds and thousands of years ago. You know, I'm beginning to think I mis misread that. That might, might have been the first century B.C.E., before current era, or B.C., which well, that's the, the dating pr uh, procedure that I grew up with. And uh, so it might have been a good uh, many hundreds of years when this guy thought that stuff up. And he developed that. Okay, so he probably was uh, like a, a Steve Jobs genius of the time. Okay, nobody would, other than the sailors who all who constantly, uh, forever used wind to push them their ships around. He on land de uh, devised a method by which he could, you know, utilize wind to do work on land. Okay, which you know that apparently back then that was uh, brand spanking new. Okay, well, forward, going forward in time, in the 1600s, a German physicist by the name of Otto von Gerich first invented a vacuum pump that utilized air pressure. Okay, now we've gone from using air, like wind, to move things like a big propeller or something to do work, to now capturing air to do work. Okay, inside a mechanism, inside a piece of equipment, making, you know, baby steps. It took many, many hundreds of years to do baby steps. Uh, don't forget, the new, the guys who were inventing stuff were always, you know, fighting against the people who just don't like change. Okay, you know, why do you have a car, you know, horses did fine for thousands of years. Well, you always have people that, that think that way. Uh, and they feel comfortable with that. They're very, they're frightened of change. They think change is going to ruin their life, ruin their world as they know it. Okay? So these guys always had uh, to fight against people who didn't like change. So in baby steps, uh, any technology was worked on, sometimes in, in secret, uh, and, and slowly but surely developed. Now, <coughs> pardon me, from about seven, uh, 1760 to between 1820 and 1840, the Industrial Revolution in Europe and America had been developing and was a transition to new manufacturing processes, which required the development of new tools and equipment. The human invention went rampant. Okay, uh, some things worked, some things didn't, but the things that worked stayed in the workplace and improved not only the manufacturing of certain items that humans were, you know, used to using, or they either they they improve the manufacturing process or improve the product uh, quality wise or improve the the uh, time at which it took to make that product so you can mass produce stuff and you know in new in mass producing things uh, you know in the uh, the theory is uh, you could sell it for less and then more people could buy your product because not a lot of people have a lot of money okay if you could bring it down to uh, making this thing and you could sell it for an egg You got lots of people out there with uh, eggs, okay? They'd come by and they'd, they'd here's my egg. I want this hoe 
uh, no, I'm not talking about anything bad. I'm talking like maybe a hoe for gardening or a rake or a scythe or a sickle and whatever it was the guy was making. Okay, so in the Industrial Revolution, a lot of new processes were devised to make the same thing and new equipment and new, uh, new tools were invented to facilitate uh, making these things better and faster. In 1829, the very first air compressor was patented. And in 1890 was, was improved by using water jacketing to keep the, uh, keep the uh, cylinders cool so the air compressor could run longer. Okay, uh, 42 years after the invention of the air compressor, Samuel Ingersoll, I think most of you who are into, uh, in, you know, pneumatics will recognize the name Ingersoll, invented the pneumatic drill. Uh, 19 years later, another fella, his name was Charles Brady, invented the pneumatic powered hammer. Now, it wouldn't take too uh, much <coughs> pardon me, for people to realize that how important the pneumatic hammer was in mining. Okay? Uh, pneumatic hammers, when they were developed and, and perfected, were, were utilized uh, in every mine that you had to use, uh, you know, explosives to bust out the, uh, the ore and, and rock that you needed to wh whatever mine you were in, whether it be you're looking for copper, lead, silver, gold, whatever it is, you, use, you used to use a hammer with a star drill, <coughs> and basically, <coughs> excuse me, basically a star drill. Uh, if you look at the end of the drill, you have two pieces, uh, you have a, an X-shaped uh, end, and uh, then if you turn it sideways to look at it on the side, the X-shaped had a kind of a, you know, an incline or a, a uh, joining of the metals at the very end. It wasn't, it had a point to it, in other words, okay? And you used to have guys who would hit, turn, hit, turn hit turn until they got deep enough where you could utilize uh, your, your explosives oh, that took days and days and people had to rest because you know hitting it with a ha nice heavy hammer while doing better work and chipping more uh, stone out out of the hole that you're trying to generate wore you out <clears throat> okay so a great improvement in the mining uh, technology uh, mining industry when they invented the, the pneumatic powered hammer now a mere 23 years after that after the pneumatic um, powered hammer was invented a patent was issued to the George Old, uh, Oldman and Son company on a pneumatic sand rammer uh, a pneumatic sand rammer that looked a lot like this. Okay. Uh, you look. If you are interested enough, you can you can look up that patent, and you'll see the drawing, and it looks considerably like this, all the way from 1913. Okay. Now, when I first came in the Navy, went through boot camp and went through the went through uh, Mulder A School, <clears throat> and. Uh, in the Mulder A school, we not only have, still had this to make uh, molds with, it, when we were good little boys, we were allowed to use the pneumatic rammer, which helped us make molds considerably faster. And uh, when this was invented, the, the molding technology went ballistic, went, went off uh, like gangbusters. Because, I mean, you can make, in 10, 15 minutes, you can make a 12 by 12 mold by hand, whereas with one of these, 
it can take as much as 15 seconds okay and uh, so it not only made making molds that much faster but the consistency from bottom to top was was uh, controlled by a device instead of you in the beginning having the hand rammer and you're nice and strong and you're ramming hard and then you're getting tired you're getting less strong so you're not ramming quite as hard and uh, well the the tightness of the metal or rather of the sand inside your your flask hard in the beginning uh, less hard at the top when you're doing it by my, my a hand rammer uh, you took that away when you used a mechanism to do the same job because this doesn't get tired okay now this weighs probably eight or nine pounds so in time the molder is going to get tired holding this thing up uh, I'll make a uh, I'll demonstrate how you would use it. Here's my air air hose, if it don't come off on me. And you would get over your your mold and you would ram it up. Now I I turned down the pressure so this thing wouldn't be jumping all over in my hands because you can have it up to what 80 pounds per square inch and this would hit considerably harder okay. but you can see how how, what, how it works it starts compressing as you move inside the blast it starts hitting the sand compressing it forming a nice hard sand okay now if you are using this it's really unlikely that you're going to hit or uh, uh, strike the sand so hard that you're going to have to worry about whether or not you're ruining the sand's permeability. Uh, anybody who's seen any of the you know other videos that I have, I uh, when I mention permeability, what I'm talking about is that because you know you're using sand, and imagine that those are boulders. Okay, you've you've wrapped the boulders in clay. You sprinkle the the clay with water, and you can you can put the boulders together, and it'll it'll not come apart very easily. Okay, you're sticking the two faces of these uh, the clay together, and anybody who's worked with clay, even in just the artistic field, knows, or farmers. When you're out there in the field and you've got a bunch of like Georgia red clay, you know how sticky that doggone stuff is, and uh, how, you know, how it can possibly be that sand will stick together and act as a nice solid mold in the foundry tray. Okay, so you got these big boulders and you push them together, and the boulders don't melt, and the thickest part goes into the thickest part. No, you've got two edges that come together, and that part where the edges come together, that's the part that's sticking together. Now imagine, you don't have so much clay <coughs> that you're going to fill in all the gaps between those boulders. So those gaps, now we're going we're gonna to start thinking about how these are sand grains now. The gaps between the sand grains allows for the passage of both vapors and uh, and gases okay uh, if you're using petrobon sand you're, it's going to be allowing the gases from the the that have been generated from the uh, petroleum product that you know bonds uh, petrobon together or actually acts as a uh, as a bonding agent the petrobon powder is the actual clay and the the oil er, is the stuff that makes all of it uh, stick together once you add it you, you you know the and when you pour molten metal into petrobond molds the oil 
where the petro petroleum product is burnt off and it, it's formed into a gas. Now that gas, if you, uh, if you pour molten metal into a mold cavity and there's no place for that gas to go, it's likely to displace any of your molten metal. So you'll have them, you know, a, a, almost like looks like a bubble inside your casting. That's trapped, uh, trapped air or trapped vapor or trapped gas, okay? If, if you ram it too hard, ram the sand too hard, you're not going to ram it too hard with your own, only your, just your uh, muscles. So you don't have to worry about it so much. The permeability of the sand will allow the gases, which is under a lot of pressure from the hydraulic uh, force generated by the molten metal, to go away in between the, ga the uh, grains and making their way away from the mold cavity. Okay. Now in green sand, <coughs> the part of the green sand that turns into a vapor is the water. You have water vapor being generated when the molten metal hits the sides of the uh, mold cavity. Okay. And you still need permeability, right? Uh, so if you're hand ramming, you know, your molds, not that much of a problem with it, but because we have pneumatic rammers now, you can ram the, the sand so hard that you're virtually eliminating the permeability of the sand. Hence the reason why I constantly uh, advise you to use vents. You know, vent your, vent your molds, um, making holes in the sand to allow the gases that are trying to escape an avenue through which they can escape, okay? Now, uh, there was a, a I, I, I saw it once, we never really ever used it. I imagine they're very, very um, useful out in the civilian, uh, you know, industry, foundry industry that uh, needs to make a, a, a thousand, a hundred thousand uh, molds in a daytime. And uh, they don't, you know, the more you uh, ram those, those molds hard, uh, the more you're apt to uh, mess up because you're going to trap the gases generated inside the mold cavity. Uh, so they had a actual handheld meter, not meter, um, dial. You had a dial which looked like about the same size as the dials on an indicator uh, if you're a if you're a uh, machinist, but the difference was is the dial is on top of a like a flat platform, and underneath this flat platform was a a curvature which basically looked like just the edge of a a ball bearing that was hang that was sticking out of the flat platform. Okay, if you took this uh, meter and you went over to a mold where the, the, you know, it was all done and you put it on it and you pressed it against the sand where the flat part was actually on the sand, your pre the, the uh, hardness of the, of the sand that it comes in contact with will push that, what a ball I'll call it, up into the meter and you get a reading on that meter and they, they, uh, the reading in, you know, that was generated by the pressure that you put against it was converted to how many pounds per square inch that you've uh, you've got that that will be needed to pass through that sand. Okay, you get up to like 90 psi. You're not gonna you know you're 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 gonna have a lot of trapped gas. I never used that much. I mean, I can see the use of it. And otherwise, it never would have been invented. I mean, you, you know, human beings will not invent things unless they need things. Okay, so here we have the um, <coughs> invention of pneumatics thousand years ago, and eventually, because humans needed something, they developed tools and equipment for the foundry trade using pneumatics. Okay. Now, I tried to look up, uh, see what, what a pneumatic rammer might have cost when they first came out. Uh, didn't find it. Didn't find it. But if today's costs are any indication, I mean, remember now, 
it's a, it's old hat. This is 2019. It was invented uh, 103 years ago. So, you know, the people who developed that device, well, they got their money money back from their R&D. And so when they made them in mass, uh, the cost went down. But the very first rammers that came out, I expect were very, you know, high-end uh, devices like the, I don't know, microwave back in the late 70s when I fought, bought my first microwave. It, my first microwave was uh, $700, maybe $500. And of course now you can buy them for less than $100, okay? So over time, after the companies that devise these things, they make their money back, uh, they can go into full industrial uh, production and then through volume make their money, okay? I would have, where'd it go? I would have used this pneumatic rammer if this was the only thing that uh, they had. Okay, that this was the only thing that was, you know, capable of being bought. Now, this is the butt end of the pneumatic rammer. If I, I can, you know, it's not welded to this shaft here. You can unscrew it. And then you can also buy something that would screw onto this shaft that would be the shape of a peen. I've seen that. You know, I've, I've, I've used those before. This is heavy. Uh, but it'll do the job, okay? Now, on my first ship, the USS Fulton, uh, that was a subtender out of New London, Connecticut. That's what we had. We had either a hand rammer or a nice big heavy pneumatic rammer. And, you know, we loved the pneumatic rammer because you could make a lot of molds pretty quick, uh, have them all out on the pouring deck, pour them that day and then the next morning we would come in and shake them all out and get the castings and finish the casting up <coughs> and get, you know get them turned into uh, whoever needed the castings. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily be able to do that if all we had was the hand rammer. Now that was my first ship. Uh, my first ship I was there in between 72 and 75. The next ship I went to, the Piedmont, which was a nightmare. The Piedmont, it was, you know, it was it was a destroyer tender, and the the only bad thing about it was it was home ported, meaning that's where it, it lived all the time, home ported in Naples. Now, when you're a sailor in the Navy, and you get you get you know you got to go overseas, you look forward to uh, and back in my time it was six months. You look forward to the end of that time where you can sail back over to home and be back in the United States of America. Okay? You never realize how much you've got until you, you lose it. And being sent overseas, you lose the United States of America. All right? These folks were home ported in Naples. You want to talk about a dispirited group. A group of people that were PO'd to the max all the time. Bad attitudes. Oh my gosh. Uh, when I went in, I wrote, reported on board the, the, the Piedmont. The foundry was a crap hole. Nobody had, had cleaned that place up, it seemed like, in ages. We had a chief in there that didn't care. We had a a second class petty officer that all he ever said was fork it and he didn't mean fork you know that and he said it so much it's got I mean I'm no kind of uh, go Navy you know yay uh, Navy's the best you know I had a lot of complaints about it too but at least I didn't say fork it every gosh darn time I opened my mouth this guy was getting bad on my nerves okay and, uh, no, he was the third class. I was the second class. I outranked him. <coughs> and if I was, you know, if he was like that much longer, this guy wouldn't have been a third class anymore. Uh, or he might not even been in the foundry anymore because I would have rode his butt up and uh, gotten rid of him quick. But we still had 
the pneumatic rammer, the heavy one, okay? We used it whenever we needed to ram stuff up. I think the, uh, we didn't have a hand rammer anymore. We relied totally on the pneumatics, okay? Every ship that I was ever on had uh, compressed air you know, in every shop that could possibly use a compressed air device, right? Uh, so after the ship went, you know, we finally got okay to get back to the United States. Uh, and I was only on that ship probably a, a year at max. But they sent, they gave me orders out to San Diego. Was there for two years, loved it, loved San Diego. Uh, love that, that, that foundry because we, we did so much stuff that we couldn't do on the ships. I learned a lot out there. Uh, then I was sent to the USS Sierra. Now the USS Sierra, uh, waiting on, in that foundry was a very pleasant surprise. Okay? While it was a pneumatic rammer, it wasn't that heavy doggone rammer that we would have to use all day and control the power and all that. We had a pneumatic rammer like this. Now, this one, you know, that one has a metal end, a, me a butt, a metal B-U-T-T -T butt end, okay? And most all of the, those big heavy rammers had, had that. Uh, this one, it's a butt, but you can also unscrew this and put a, a wedge-shaped uh, uh, part on the end of this to be able to ram up, you know, con in a, a shape, um, concentrated place, okay? And you would make it a little bit harder, all right? Uh, this thing was at both the Sierra and the Yosemite, you know, this size. Didn't have to use those anymore. Now, we're talking improvements over the years. All right, uh, I was in the Navy 20 years, and it was only the last two ships, the Sierra and the Yosemite, both destroyer tenders. Uh, the Sierra was out of Charleston, uh, South Carolina, and the Yosemite out of Mayport, Florida, where I retired. And, uh, but we still could use these to make ram, uh, ram up molds fast, and get them on deck, and get them poured that day, and then, complete the what we had to do the next day okay and I'll show you how how this one goes now remember I still only have very low air pressure right now but as you can see the low air pressure still gives me some good power on this one okay that low air pressure fills up this cylinder, the air, the gap, you know, in here, and uh, does a good job. I, when I start using this, you know, because I do have some molds to make in the near future, when I start using this, I'm going to turn up the, uh, you know, gas, or rather the pneumatic setting. I think it's, I only got it on 40 right now. I'm going to bring it up to about 60 maybe. I don't need it any higher than that. I mean, I'm not making anything. I'm not going to be pouring Monel, let's say, where you would have to have something extremely hard to keep Monel from from busting up your mold, um, you know. So I'm going to bring it up to about 40 or 60, and uh, uh, you know, you'll see exactly uh, how effective these pneumatic rammers are. Okay, I advise you to get one if you got the money. They're not cheap. For instance. It took me quite a while to find a company that had these, and it cost me $400. The good news is, this will last you forever, if you keep it lubricated, okay? You just use regular pneumatic uh, oil, you know, pneum for, uh, oil for pneumatic tools, and if you keep it, uh, you clean it, and you keep it oiled, You'll die of old age and pass this down to your, to your, uh, you know, the children or your grandchildren, okay? So, but you will see how much better your molds are and uh, 
then you'll realize how you do need to vent your your molds like I've been showing you in the other uh, videos okay so it's not going to be a very long video this time uh, I hope I didn't bore you to tears with the, the, the little bit of history that I had to go with <coughs> but uh, in the near future if I can get my lazy rear going I'll be out here doing some molding and you'll be uh, along for the ride so from here from me sand rammer uh, aka Tom kitchen I'll be seeing you next time please you know pass the word about this channel so that people can learn how to safely make molds and make good castings okay I I mean I'm not gonna beat my chest and say I've made uh, nothing but perfect castings my entire career periodically you'll find that no matter how many uh, you know precautions you take to make a good casting the the gods of ca of, of mold making will throw a, a zinger at you and it'll make you make another one for whatever reason okay so back here at ye old foundry or otherwise known as my garage uh, please you know any comments that you want to make good or bad go ahead and make them and uh, press the like or the dislike whichever whichever is appropriate for you and uh, you know spread the word try to get more people to watch watch these videos so that we don't lose the knowledge of how to use how to make um, you know castings uh, hopefully with this president we have enticing industry back into the United States hopefully they'll start you know having more foundries put back together and be able to make more stuff but how you gonna how you gonna man those foundries if you don't have somebody who knows at least the least bit of, of the foundry trade and how to make molds okay if you learn this trade and you find a new foundry opening up run over there at the very least, even if what you've learned from these videos isn't adequate for that foundry if they hire you you will learn more every day you work in a foundry you learn something new no matter what it is okay so uh, from the old the old foundry to you uh, have a good day or night or wherever you are and uh, we I, I uh, look forward to having you look at the rest of my videos all right see you later